Hi, this is Kimball Fraser. Next to me, Clay Foster, and also on the split screen is Gilsung Park. These are two of the co-authors on our recent paper on Uncatarget. Uncatarget has asked us to sort of summarize the, the work in this manuscript and also put it in a larger context of other work that we've done related to this manuscript. I'm going to try and briefly tell you the story here, and along the way, I'll ask Clay and Gilsung to chime in with specific experiments that they did. Before we get into the Uncatarget paper, I should mention that in the prior year, we actually had a couple of other papers that we published in a journal of leukemia. All of these have dealt with essentially the same topic, which is the discovery of B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia in a zebrafish model that was created many years ago, actually, about 10 years ago. And this zebrafish model is one that our lab and many other labs have used over the past decade. It uses a zebrafish RAG2 promoter, which is active in immature B and T cells, to drive a transgene, human mix specifically, to induce leukemia. A landmark work by Dave Langenau, it really almost two decades ago, 2003, I believe, was the first example of driving cancer in zebrafish with a transgene. It was done at the time with murine mic in a near identical setup, again, using the zebrafish RAG2 promoter. And people had been using that model for a long time. A little over a decade or so later, Alejandro Gutierrez came along and made the line that we used, that used human mic rather than murine mic. And people continued studying T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia in those fish. So I acquired those animals from Alejandro, golly, probably almost 10 years ago now, before I came to my current institution. And we had been studying them for some time. And we've been studying a particular context with a marker transgene that used the zebrafish LCK promoter, a promoter that's highly active in T cells, to drive GFP. And so in our hands, we saw lots of animals that got T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and it was easy to recognize those leukemias because they were all glowing bright green. A former postdoc in the lab, Chiara Borga, who's also a co-author on this current paper, really made the important observation that these animals were getting dim cancers also. In other words, cancers that when you looked at the zebrafish through the microscope, they were fluorescent, but not impressively so. And I really can't speak to other laboratories that had been using this model, but I can tell you, speaking from my own perspective, having looked at these animals an awful lot over 10 years, I had really discarded these animals, figuring that these were either animals that had early TALL that just hadn't blossomed, or were maybe just animals that didn't have malignancy at all, that just happened to have an accumulation of T cells. So in these two prior manuscripts, we did lots and lots of studies to prove that they in fact were B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and to show that the genes that zebrafish B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia express are similar to the same genes that human BALL also expresses. The other thing that we did was about the same time that we were discovering zebrafish BALL in our model system, the Langenau group that I already referred to that continues to use the murine mic model also discovered BALL in their system. And so we had also written another paper where we compared BALLs between these two zebrafish systems. So now the Oncotarget paper was really sort of ongoing work that we continue to expand on. And I, I'm sort of gonna just walk through the paper. You'll have to excuse me, I have the paper over in another monitor. I'm gonna scroll through it and more or less just tell you what I think are some of the important features of the figures. So in the first figure, Gilsung did a really awesome experiment that highlights the beauty of zebrafish as a cancer model. He monitored over 600 animals that were carrying this constellation of a RAG2 human mic and an LCK GFP transgene to see which animals got TALL, which would be bright under the microscope and that we could prove by fluorescent microscopy as well as flow cytometric analysis of the individual ALL cells. And rather than tell you the result, I think maybe I'll just invite Gilson to tell you what was the result that he saw when he monitored these 600 animals for the better part of a year. So about day 180, uh, about 40% of fish developed the TALL, which is a bright tumor, and about 12% developed the BLL, which is also a dim tumor, and other 7% of fish developed the both Similar, simultaneous T and B ALL at the same time. So, but over the year, about the, the percentage of the TLL kind of increased to 60, about 64%, and BLL is up to 23%, and mixed ALL is up to 13%. Thanks, Gilson. So, I'll make a few comments. 
The first is just to make sure people who haven't been following this story closely, what Gilson means when he says mixed ALL. Wow. So, you know, these fish have B cells and T cells and they can get two cancers at the same time, just like people, unfortunate people could get two cancers at the same time. So when he refers to mixed ALL, He's talking about a zebrafish that has the misfortune, if you will, of having both a BALL and a TALL at the same time. And we think these are, you know, totally independent events, obviously related by the transgenic human mech driving them. But to me, an animal that gets BALL is an animal that got BALL, whether it happens to have TALL or not. Okay, so that was sort of clarification. So the two important things that I think are apparent from this study, the first I already alluded to. And that is that, you know, this is a huge study, 600 animals, people who study cancer using mouse models could never do this. It would cost too much, not to mention, you wouldn't want to have to bleed mice every three weeks to look at them. Or if you were using luciferase and CCD cameras, you wouldn't want to anesthetize mice every few weeks to look at them. But it was relatively trivial, easy for me to say, because Gilson did all the heavy lifting. But it was relatively trivial for Gilson to take a large number of animals sedate them on a regular basis every several weeks, look at them under the microscope, fit, find which ones had bright tumors, which ones have dim tumors, and do all the downstream processing. So I think this really shows something that you can do in zebrafish that you can't do in other cancer models. The other important thing that it shows, and in terms of sort of maybe solving the unspoken mystery of why did we know about TLL and zebrafish for over 10 years, but we didn't know about BALL, I think this is at least one of the answers to that mystery. It's probably not all of them, but it's the answer to the mystery in my lab. And that is not only are the BALL dimmer, making them harder to see, but also the BALL happen about one fourth or one fifth as often as TALL. So on balance, you're getting a lot more animals that have TALL and have BALL, and the TALL is easier to detect than the BALL. So I think collectively that sort of accounts for Gilson's results. Now, I will tell you that we have some interesting and what I find to be exciting results that all comes from Gilson's work that's going to expand on this part of the story a bit in the future. I'm sorry to say I'm not ready to disclose that information just yet, but maybe that'll be in a forthcoming Anka Target paper. The other thing that we show in figure one, I'm not going to take you through every figure and every panel, but at the end of figure one, we also show a couple of new lines that Gilson and Amira Hassan, another co-author in our paper, on our paper in my lab, also made. And we're using these a lot going forward. So, I mean, it's really cool to me that the LCK GFP transgene allows you to see both T and B A L L in the same animal or in different animals, and that the brightness of the fluorescence allows you to get a, an early snapshot of whether you think it's TALL or BALL that you can confirm in the future. But I've already pointed out how difficult it is to detect BALL in these animals. Yours truly looked at these animals for probably five years without ever detecting BALL. It took somebody smarter than me like Kiara to come along and recognize that BALL was present. And so for the old and infirm and blind like me, I thought it would be really useful to have lines where BALL would be obvious and easy to recognize. And I thought that would be useful not only in terms of making the disease easier to detect, but also in terms of being able to find drugs or test new drugs to show that animals were responding. And so this wasn't a complicated experiment. In fact, it's not even really an experiment. It's really just sort of a construction. But we took two other transgenic lines that had been created by another laboratory that again use zebrafish promoters, promoters for either CD79A or CD79B. These are two different proteins that are both highly expressed by B cells, but to our knowledge are not expressed by T cells or other cell types and using them to drive GFP instead of LCK. And so also in figure one, you can see examples of animals that have BALL with either of these marker transgenes, and they just look like TALL in the LCK background. The tumors are bright, and that makes them easy to detect, and it also makes it really easy to see if the tumors are responding to treatments. So that segues nicely into what I think is figure two, if I remember correctly, and yeah, it is. So figure two is a composite of just uh, six different animals, three of them that were treated with dexamethasone, a glucocorticoid that's routinely used in both T and BALL treatment in human beings. Gilson did the experiments with dexamethasone. It also shows three other animals that were treated with radiation, a therapy that used to be used a lot in ALL, 
that is still used in some cases, but because of toxicity, we've tried to replace it with drugs. And it shows animals, most of them are in the LCK background, but one example animal is in the CD79A background. And it shows that all six of these animals, as well as many, many others that aren't shown in the figure, respond to these same two treatment modalities, just like human ALL does. And so I think that already shows how the CD79A animals are actually probably a lot more powerful than the LCK animals if you want to look at the ALL. Probably nothing else to tell you about figure two. Figure three. So figure three is an expansion of some data that we already published, I guess, in our first leukemia paper about this story. And I'm going to call Clay in in just a minute. But um, by and large, this is an experiment looking at gene expression. It's using a really cool technique called nanostring that I won't go into details in. But this is experiments that Gilson and Chiara did together ooh, probably about three years ago. And again, like I mentioned, we'd already published some of this in one of our prior leukemia papers. But in the leukemia paper, mostly what we did was look at the genes that distinguish BALL from TALL in zebrafish. And then we looked at the genes that zebrafish BALL express and compared them to genes that human BALL express, excuse me. So this figure, which I guess is figure three in the Anka target manuscript, sort of breaks things down a little bit more. I, I don't know, I'm sort of putting play on the spot. I didn't tell him I was asked going to ask him to do this. But the three different panels of figure three look at not every sample, but a large number of different samples that we did, mm -hmm. and then breaks it down in a way that we didn't in our prior manuscript, and also includes some samples that we hadn't included in our prior manuscript. Two or figure 3b looks at marrow samples of lymphocytes, and figure 3c looks at thymus samples of lymphocytes. And I'm going to shut up. I don't know if Clay has anything to chime in, but even if he doesn't, I have something else where he'll get to talk about I mean, it. that's that's pretty much it, yeah. These are, yeah, just the nanostring data that Kiara had looked at a little bit. A lot of these are, these are sort of hand-picked genes that we think diagnostic between the two different groups just to see the differences. But yeah, I mean, there's not much more to that figure. So there's not much more to that figure, but I hope there's going to be a lot more to this story. So figure 3C looks only at thymic lymphocytes. And some of these thymic lymphocytes, the ones that don't express very much GFP, are B lineage, we think. And some of them, those that express GFP highly, are T lineage. And so this is a nice snapshot. Like Clay mentioned, these are sort of hand-picked uh, genes that we thought would be good at distinguishing B and T cells. And in our hands, they proved to do that. But just like everybody else, we're evolving into single-cell RNA-seq studies. And two people in my lab, both co-authors on this paper, primarily Amira, but also Gilsung, are now doing lots of single cell sequencing of both B and TALL cells and B and T cells from thymus and marrow and spleen and other lymphoid organs. And so many of these same genes shown here are proving to be sort of the diagnostic genes that we're using to identify cells in a single cell context and work that we hope to publish in the relatively near future. I think that's it for figure three. Figure four is really all the work Jessica Burroughs Garcia, another former postdoc in the laboratory, couldn't be with us with, for the Skype call. So Jessica, so I guess sort of the intermediate between doing experiments like nanostring or bulk RNA-seq, where we looked at a bunch of different leukemia cells or a bunch of different lymphocytes all at the same time, and then the single cell RNA-seq studies that I just alluded to that we've done and are doing but haven't published on yet. So in this particular figure, what Jessica did was she took individual cells and rather than doing single cell RNA-seq on them, she did single cell QRT-PCR to see which genes were expressed by individual TLL cells or BALL cells. And, you know, really, this result didn't show anything surprising, but it showed something that was nonetheless pretty important to us. She did a lot of different single cell experiments, and this is a small subset of those. But what this figure is showing is just that 10 BALL cells, all of those cells individually are expressing lots of B cell genes, but not many, if any, T cell genes. And conversely, 10 TALL cells are expressing lots of T cell genes, but not many or any B, B cell genes. So exactly what one would expect, but I mean, as we all know in science, sometimes what you expect isn't what you get. So that was a pretty important experiment for Jessica to do. And like I said, we're sort of sitting on some other unpublished work that she did that's related to this that we hope to publish in the not too distant future. 
figure five we can largely skip by. It's not really an experiment. It's just an alignment between human and murine mix. And the reason we chose to include it here was just to show readers that human and murine mic are nearly identical at the protein level. And, you know, we didn't publish this, but Clay, this actually it gives, does give me another opportunity. I know Clay isn't going to remember any of this off the top of his head, but Clay did a really methodical amino acid by amino acid and domain by domain comparison of murine and human mic. He flooded my inbox with this. He wasn't in our group physically at the time. So I don't know if he's going to, if he can really tell you anything, but I can tell you what my gestalt from his extensive analysis was. And that is, we'd expect that human and Murin mix should do the exact same thing. You know, anything to add to that? There was one, if I remember right, this was quite a while ago, but um, there was one key change, I think in the, in the dimerization domain, there was one key change in an electrostatic interaction that I think my conclusion was that that was probably pretty important into what HMIC and MMIC, the difference, whatever difference there is, that was probably pretty key to it. I don't remember exactly which residue it was. It was too long ago. I'd have yeah. to look back. Well, clearly Clay remembers it much better than I, because I didn't even remember that hallmark residue. Maybe we should have highlighted here our, my oversight in the figure. But I think the important point is, I mean, we don't have any experimental validation. Now that I have Clay here, maybe we'll do some experiments that can experimentally validate it. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the other mysteries that sort of came out of this project wasn't only the fact that Mick could drive T versus BALL and the fact that one one was really easily forthcoming and the other came a decade later. The other thing that we saw, and this was a collaborative work with the Langenau group, was we saw that the BALL that were driven by Murin Mick and the BALL that were driven by human Mick actually have very different gene expressions. And that's actually going to be the last figure that we'll get to in just a second. But, you know, there's several potential explanations for why that might be. I think I could speak for Dave Langenau in saying that he felt that, that probably it was the strain background that might be the key difference, that if we put Murray and Mick in our background, maybe they would look more like the gene expression profiles they saw. And that conversely, if we put human Mick in their genetic background, maybe the opposite would be the case. That certainly a possibility. For me personally, I sort of felt like, well, maybe it's just like an expression level difference. You know, the RAG2 promoters, we think are the same, but they undoubtedly landed in different places in the genome because they were just put in by random TOL2 transgenesis. So they could sort of have landed anywhere. So maybe murine MIC and human MIC are expressed in different levels, not only in the two different genotypes, but also maybe in B versus T cells. So that's a potential explanation. Clay just alluded to a potential molecular interaction. You know, MIC has to either hetero or homodimerize to do its thing transcriptionally. There are also several other proteins that either can bind MIC and sequester it from doing its thing or can bind with MIC's partners and sequester them from doing their things. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that if dimerization were different in the in a zebrafish between human and murine MIC, that might account for differences. So we don't have any answers here, but uh, that's the mystery that could be solved going forward if, if we or others step forward to do it. So the last part of our figure, uh, sorry, of our manuscript is figure six. And figure six is sort of a redo of some experiments that we published in a prior leukemia paper. Mm -hmm. It's redone in a couple of ways. One is the samples that were used aren't the exact same, and the other is the bioinformatics tools were not the exact same. This is really, I kind of twisted Clay's arm to make him participate in this interview. <laughs> he was a little camera shy, but if he'd be willing, I'd like him to tell us a little about the bioinformatic analysis that he did, because like I said, it was very similar to the collaborative work we did with the Langenau group in the prior leukemia paper, mm -hmm. but he more or less just used different tools to look at gene expression. And I, to me, what he showed was that, well, when you use different tools, a lot of your results are the same, but they're not exactly the same. Sure. Um, I mean, we, the, 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 we were certainly trying to cast maybe a little bit wider net here than we had before in the leukemia paper. So some of our thresholds were a little bit lower in stringency, but we basically, this is the compare, we, we compared the HMIC BALLs, which we were calling IGHZ positive. We found this in the leukemia paper with the Langenau group, and we compared it with the Murin MIC we called IGHM positive. 
So Z is the HMIC, is the uh, MMIC. And we did just a basic reanalysis of those two groups using, there were a few technical differences. We had a little bit more of an updated genome. As I said, our thresholds uh, and parameters were a little bit differently. The tools that we used were a little bit different. We did an over-representation analysis using a little bit more modern uh, gene sets just to see what differences uh, we could find. And whatever jumped out at us, that's what we were trying to see, was to get a clue at some sort of biological process that was different between these two. So one of the challenges that we ran into with when we were working on one of the leukemia uh, papers was that you know, we, we didn't, the discovery of these BALL population was unexpected. And the samples that we were using here, it was questionable how uh, pure, I guess, of a population that was. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, we thought, I thought that these things were, this was all bulk RNA-seq analysis. Right. And I think that 95 plus percent, maybe 99 plus percent of cells were BALL cells, mm -hmm. but maybe not 100 percent of cells. Mm -hmm. And I think that's happened for other people's bulk studies, too. When you purify BALL, you're also purifying non-malignant lymphocytes, too. We had not only that concern, but that when in purifying our BALL, that we might have been purifying some T cells too. And we thought that that might have sort of confounded. confounded. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We had a preliminary gene list from results for samples that we thought were more homogenous, a more pure, I guess, BLL population. And we try to use those that gene list as sort of like a, a checklist on these samples to sort of exclude things that we thought, well, perhaps this gene actually only seemed up because of maybe the small population of T cells that we saw in one of our samples versus the one of the NMIC, the murine mix samples. Um, so we tried to exclude uh, genes that we thought were a result of that to try and, I guess, remove those that confound yeah. that confounding right. effect. We think this is a more authentic list. Yeah. Or, I guess, we think that it's a more authentic list, except for all the genes that carry an asterisk in figure six. <laughs> so I know that Clay didn't want to include these because Clay's a hardcore uh, bioinformatician and biostatistician who wants to do everything the right way. And I'm kind of a, an old school, old fart. And so I see trends. And so I really pushed hard. I don't know, probably all the other co-authors around here didn't like it too much, but I'm the boss. So we got to do it my way and <laughs> reviewers didn't object. So I really wanted to show something that didn't pass statistical threshold criteria, but to me was intriguing. And I would invite reviewers and readers to look at the data yourself and you can decide whether you think I'm right or whether you think we should be hardcore statisticians. I think it's really intriguing that in the human mic driven BALL, we see that an awful lot of other, what I'll just loosely call mic family genes are upregulated in those tumor cells. What I mean by that is, so both the human and zebrafish genome have other mic family members besides what used to be called CMIC, and now we just say mic. There's also NMIC, there's also LMIC. In zebrafish, it turns out there's actually CMIC A and CMIC B. And then there are lots of Max and MAD, other heterodimerization partners. Not every single one of these genes, but what to me seemed like a non-random assortment of MIC and MIC-related genes are all much more highly expressed in the human MIC model than in the murine MIC model. And I don't know, maybe that dovetails nicely with Clay's point about potential changes in the two protein structures that might account for different dimerization uh, partnering interactions. Having said that, this is RNA data, not protein, so maybe it doesn't mean a darn thing. Anyway, I just wanted to throw it out there because I thought it was an interesting difference, even though I recognize and the asterisks denote that not every one of these genes met uh, criteria for statistical significance. Now, in my defense, I would say that, you know, this is a very small sample set. We had four human mic driven BALL, and really we only had two murine mic driven BALL from the Langenau group that they had sequenced independently twice. So to me, the fact that they didn't meet statistical significance wasn't that surprising. When you're only looking at four versus two samples, something's got to be nearly black and white to jump out as statistically significant. So I would argue uh, if and when we get around to doing 
10 human BALL and 10 Miri BALL, that all of the genes that I think matter will, will hold up. But until we do that, I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know, that kind of brings us to the end. We didn't go through every little, you know, dotted I and cross T, but I think those are sort of the main points in the paper, both what we can conclude and what we can't yet conclude. And what we hope to do experiments to, to learn the answer to in the future. So I don't think I have anything else to say. I've rambled on. For those of you who've actually viewed this whole video, I can't believe it. You must be interested in the topic. And if you are, feel free to reach out to me or any of my co-authors. We'd be happy to talk to you about it more.